this story is kind of my love letter to rock and roll. And it's called, The Devil's Music Made Me Gay. <laughs> Growing up in a Latino family, I was exposed to the greats of Latin music. Artists like Tito Puente, Johnny Pacheco, and of course the queen of salsa, Celia Cruz. My mom played piano occasionally, and my dad played the conga, bongos, and the harmonica. They would sometimes jam together, playing along with the records on the turntable. But the music in our house was mostly an invitation to dance. No way could you sit still while listening to those amazing Afro-Cuban rhythms. Even though I loved shaking my preteen booty to my parents' music, as I started to approach adolescence, I felt like it was their music, not mine. So, with the help of the Ed Sullivan Show on TV and good old AM radio, I discovered the music that moved my generation. First, there was Little Richard, known as the architect of rock and roll. He influenced Elvis, the Rolling Stones, and just about everyone else in the early days of rock. When I first heard and saw Little Richard on TV, something inside me shifted. He <laughs> blew my mind with his guy liner, pencil thin mustache, and giant pompadour. He was like nothing anyone had ever seen. Then I started grooving to Motown and pop. I was swept away. I mean, when I heard, this diamond ring doesn't shine for me anymore, and this diamond ring doesn't mean what it did before, I thought, there will never be a better pop song than that. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't grow up to be a record producer. <laughs> My rock and roll seduction continued with the whole British invasion of bands, the Beach Boys, Janis Joplin, and countless other artists who made me feel more alive than ever before. I was coming of age with a new soundtrack to help me cope with all my teen angst. Meanwhile, our society was in chaos. By the time I reached high school, the Vietnam War was raging, dividing the country politically and scaring the shit out of me and all of my male friends. We knew that if the war continued, when we turned 18, we would have to register for the draft. I couldn't imagine going through basic training, let alone actual combat. And the other option, escaping to Canada, it was impossible for me to wrap my head around that. My new rock gods, along with the hippies that I tried to emulate with my longish hair, fringe vests, and hip hugger pants from Fred Siegel. <laughs> they were all telling me to resist. Tune in, turn on, drop out. That was the rallying cry. We tuned in and we realized the horrors of the war. Rock bands and folk artists provided the anthems that fueled our protests and our marches. The anti-war movement grew and my music became more vital than ever. Then the shit really hit the fan. We turned on. With rock stars serving as role models of debauchery, <laughs> teens and adults from all over the country flocked to San Francisco, LA, New York, and started experimenting with drugs. Drugs were everywhere, and I was being tempted, like Alice in Wonderland, into a whole new reality. The Doors, Led Zeppelin, Jefferson Airplane, Dylan, The Birds, Pink Floyd, and on and on. They were telling me it was okay to be tripping. I knew the desire to alter my consciousness was already within me, even though it was almost completely destroyed with my first experience a night of chugging down cheap gallo wine with two friends in middle school <laughs> that ended up with us puking our guts out. Drugs were subverting everything in mainstream society, especially the psychedelics. You can't just go back to your normal life after staring in a mirror and watching your face melt for two hours <laughs> and the visual trails of your hands moving through the air. My best high school buddy Richard and I vowed to stay away from drugs until we were 21. We didn't want to risk overdosing or having a bad trip. 
A few months later, I ditched high school during lunch and smoked a joint <laughs> with two gal pals under the Shakespeare Bridge on Franklin Avenue in Las Feliz. And well before we turned 21, Richard and I dropped acid for our high school senior grad night party <laughs> at Disneyland. <laughs> Thank you, rock and roll. I escaped the draft for a couple of years with a student deferment by enrolling in the Los Angeles City College Theater Arts Academy. <laughs> Having already crossed the line on drugs, doing plays and hanging out with neurotic young actor types, in drama school took me to some new places. And since the theater is known as a haven for queer folks, it allowed me to complete the trilogy and drop out of my hetero past. The closet door was opened and I discovered that I was gay. I fell in love with a wonderful young man named Danny. Elton John's music became our soundtrack, along with James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, and Laura Nero. As we tried to create some semblance of romance in a type of relationship none of us, or neither of us, had ever been through. The uber macho facade of rock and roll sometimes obscured the music's message about being free to do what or whom you loved. <laughs> no one in rock was out then, but I still found permission in rock sensuality to explore my emerging gay self. Then came David Bowie. <laughs> and all bets were off. Bowie taught me about androgyny, pansexuality, and the possibilities of being a space alien. <laughs> he rocked my perceptions of a rock star. All the macho posturing of rock seemed silly and superficial after that. He was my ultimate rock god. I recently found out that little Richard, the architect of rock, had to leave his family home when he was very young. He was kicked out for being gay. He defied the odds and he became a rock star. One of rock's founding artists came from the queer black culture that existed at the time. His message was loud and clear. No matter what, you have to become who you were meant to be. Long live rock. Thank you.